Before I begin talking about the next part of Star Wars, I want to address something that I kind of made as an offhand comment, didn't really think too much about when I said it, that um, George Lucas was bringing back a very traditional white guy genre, if you will. Um, now, of course, I don't think he would say that. In fact, I think he would be appalled to think that. And there's two reasons for that. One of them is that SJWs are kind of like a school of fish or a herd of extremely skittish herd animals, uh, prey animals that just dart to and fro when they see any sign of something else in the herd moving. It just sparks this, everybody moves. So there's no rhyme, reason, logic, or sense to the changes in direction that the SJW horde makes. And so it was something that wouldn't have occurred to him, which would now appall him because that is now very fashionable and faddish in the SJW horde to hate white culture and everything associated with white people and white males in particular. Um, so he would be appalled for that reason. But I think also the you got to remember that in the context in which Star Wars was made, that America was still in the 70s and 80s and even a bit into the 90s, a country almost entirely made up of white people um, that had been here, their, some of their ancestors at least, 90% of the white population had at least an ancestor who was here before the Revolutionary War. And America was still a nation of Americans. And of course we had a black population. They'd been here just as long because you know, certain people in the South had brought them here. Although they brought a lot more to Brazil and the Caribbean, of course, but um, you know, we don't think about black people outside of America for the most part. Um, they had been here. There were some Hispanics. Some of them were left over from Nueva España, but there were never really a lot of them here. So this idea that we, you know, stole some territory from is kind of ridiculous. It was, they claimed it, but hardly anybody lived here. It was just empty wilderness until we came and, and built cities here on top of the tiny villages and hamlets that they had had. Um, so America was, was a white nation. And so when he brought back something that, and Hollywood for that matter, you got to remember this is long before Hollywood became a huge blockbuster globalist enterprise. Star Wars is usually considered along with Jaws, which was made by Lucas's friend Steven Spielberg just a couple of years earlier, are considered kind of the first blockbusters. Before that, at least in the modern sense of the word, before that, Hollywood made movies for an American audience. And the American audience was, of course, almost was very homogenous uh, culturally for the most part. And people like to say that it wasn't, but but that's not really true. And the data is very clear that America was very homogenous still in the 70s. And since Hollywood made movies for America and any ticket sales that they got overseas were an added bonus that they're kind of like, hey, that's cool. But they didn't specifically try to do that. And most of those other overseas markets were they watched Hollywood films, but they also had their own film markets. And there was a German film market. There was obviously an Italian film market that had a brief international heyday in the years a little bit before Star Wars with the Spaghetti Westerns in particular. Um, you know, there were Asian markets. Hong Kong had a market. Japan had a market. George Lucas was a fan of some of the films that came out of Japan, like the Kurosawa films. Um, so... You know, I say that, but it's, it's not as meaningful as you might think because in the context in which Star Wars were, was made, it's like, well, of course he brought back something that was a traditional American uh, genre because everything that Hollywood did was um, American and it was for Americans. They, this was long before the fad started of we must hate America and hate Americans, especially if they're male. Um, so... I just wanted to address that real quick. It was a different, it was a different con cultural context, and it was surprisingly, significantly different. And I say it's surprising because I'm, you know, I'm a middle-aged guy. I'm I'm in my late 40s, but I mean, I clearly remember when that happened. I remember Star Wars coming out. I remember the context 
when the Star Wars movies came out. I remember the context of what Hollywood was doing with science fiction in the wake of Star Wars because it wasn't really that long ago. I mean, I was a kid or a teenager for most of that time. Um, so Star Wars, um, I said earlier that the setting was was not original. It was, in fact, deliver, deliberately derivative. and But it was very broad, and its influences were even more broad than even just the genre in which it is. And Lucas himself kind of said that there's an awful lot of elements of kind of, you know, California hot rod culture in it. Uh, Beach Boys style hot rod culture, which makes sense because he had made American Graffiti. But if you think about it, you know, that's kind of the Millennium Falcon is kind of a hot rod <laughs> in a way. Um, but there's elements of that. There's elements of the Western. The cantina is very much like a saloon in many regards. And Lucas himself kind of knew that this was the American mythology, if you will. And Lucas very thoughtfully tried to replicate stuff that he knew was resonant in a way that he knew current movies often weren't. And although I've never heard him say this, I think he kind of felt a disconnect from what people were making in the early to mid 70s. And he longed for stuff that was made when he was younger. And that's why one of the reasons he made Star Wars, one of the reasons he made Indiana Jones or, or had it made um, kind of under his direction as executive producer. And, and he was a founding partner there because those were the types of movies that he grew up on and he wanted to revitalize them because he knew that they would connect with audiences. Now, he was also pessimistic and he you know, always convinced himself that his movies were going to flop. And, but, you know, I, I think he was on to something and he kind of knew it and he didn't really know. He didn't really know because I think the prevailing wisdom was, oh, people don't, people have moved on. They don't want to see this. But, but he kind of felt like maybe he was the odd man out. But I think that, you know, what, what he maybe didn't really realize, but in retrospect should have been kind of obvious is that Hollywood had become, disconnected a bit from its audience not nearly as much so as they are right now but that had happened a bit in the 70s and when he kind of made something that had mass appeal again it kind of pulled hollywood back from the brink of making you know ridiculous artsy films that nobody really wanted to see because they had no cultural connection to it at all anymore um, people make a big deal out of lucas following in particular the mythic beats of Joseph Campbell and he did and I know he did it deliberately even um, but I'm I think Joseph Campbell's a bit overrated myself I think a lot of what he says is is maybe kind of superficial and, and he has to boil stuff down to such a a reduced version of it that it kind of doesn't say a lot that's meaningful or interesting so when he kind of tried to follow the beats of joseph campbell i think there were a few minor surprises there like the fact that han solo was a much more relatable likable and attractive character both to men and women alike the guys kind of related to him more and wanted to be like him girls thought he was much more attractive luke who was kind of the protagonist kind of gradually over the course of the movies became more more bland and kind of you know what's the deal with this guy he's turned into some kind of weird ascetic monk or something and he became less relatable over time which i don't think was lucas's intention at all but it in retrospect again it seems very obvious um, what i think is actually more interesting is the fact that like i said he borrowed the setting almost whole cloth from you know not from a single source but there's very little in it that's original the same is true for the plot quite honestly and a lot of people and kind of dumb people in my opinion say that star wars is a remake of the hidden fortress which is a kurosawa film that is patently not true um, i think in the very earliest drafts of star wars it more closely resembled the hidden fortress but the movie that we got doesn't very much at all um, there's the framing device of the two droids who are kind of like the two peasants 
Um, but that's kind of a minor framing device, really. And there is a princess who's being threatened and chased around. Um, but that's a very common element. It's hardly unique to a hidden fortress. So there's very little of the hidden fortress left. What you instead get is kind of the framing device from hidden fortress. Then you get this kind of uh, very standard call to adventure kind of routine with Luke where you know, follows the Joseph Campbell beats very religiously um, for a little while. And then you get um, the running around on the Death Star, which a lot of people have compared to the Alistair MacLean uh, novel and then later movie Where Eagles Dare, where, you know, a couple of British and what American secret agent are running around in a Nazi castle in World War II. Uh, I think that that actually was probably deliberate. George Lucas says, hey, let's put a sequence that's basically where Eagles Dare. And then there was another, which there's another World War II element too. Then the, the whole Death Star attack with the X-Wings and stuff is almost almost completely borrowed as is from uh, a number of old World War II movies like 633 Squadron um, and Dam Busters, both of which have plots that are remarkably similar to the trench run sequence of Star Wars. So there's very, and then if you look at also uh, stories like, I think it's uh, Triplanetary by E.E. E. Doc Smith, one of the Lensman novels, it, it also has just remarkable, uh, coincides remarkably with the plot of Star Wars. There's a guy who has secret plans to a secret weapon and he, uh, you know, he has to deal with tractor beams. He gets pulled in by him. He basically does a trench run. He has a blast shield that he puts down. I mean, there's just so many details, uh, both large and small, that are borrowed from that, that it almost feels like it was an early draft of Star Wars. It's that similar in some ways. So it's interesting to me that, that this is kind of what Star Wars is. And I, I don't say that as a knock on Star Wars. In fact, I think that that was a very smart move on Lucas's part. And I think I think that in many ways that's actually the secret of his success is that he he borrowed elements that were tried and true that were good that nobody else was playing with and he said let's bring these back because i like them and i think that probably some other people will like them and we'll see how well it does and of course people really did like them a lot more than he anticipated and i think he was even blown away by the reception um, to star wars and i think he, he hoped it would be successful obviously but I don't know that how, I don't think he ever in his wildest dreams imagined that it would become um, one of the most successful movies of all time, um, which then became one of the more successful franchises of all time. Let me go ahead and stop there. I will talk next time a little bit about uh, the rest of the original trilogy uh, that came after this, and maybe I will get into the prequel and the sequel trilogies as well. We'll see how long it takes and, and where I go. And then after that, we'll start talking about some of the expanded universe stuff and where Star Wars has gone in the past and where it seems to be going now.